thank you guys for coming. It's so good to see a packed house and to see so many familiar faces in my adopted hometown. Um, how do you like that Amazonian elephant? That's a new species even for me. Um, I am going to rush through this because we're going to go through two jungles. We're going to go through the Amazon and we're going to go through India. And let's put up my slides as soon as possible so I can tell everybody. Um, the thing is, people ask me, I've been, I've been doing this all over the country in the US for the last few months, and people keep asking me if they think of, I was born in the jungle. I wasn't born in the jungle, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm going to take you from the start of all of this because it's important to me the journey of people that are fighting for wildlife and given the state of everything and what our ecosystems and our natural world is facing, the fact that we're all here tonight for wildlife, to celebrate wildlife, to talk about jungles and the future of our, our planet um, is important. So when I was a kid, my parents made the mistake of taking me to the Bronx Zoo, which is our best zoo in New York, and big mistake. There was, so little me saw a picture of a bunch of scientists holding an anaconda. And right there, that second, I was like, that's what I want. I want to be in a jungle far away with amazing animals. And that sort of led me through the rest of my life. And then hearing all of the things that were going extinct, all the species that were losing, I grew up with a lot of stress that before I grew up, all of it would be gone. So by the time you want me closer, um, you can hear me though, right? I'm not too loud. Um, so by the time I was 17 years old, I never got on in school. I never got along with teachers. I was never good at classes. I was, they, one teacher said, a wild animal. Um, so by the time I was 17, I decided to drop out of high school to start college, and I got a job, and I saved up. And I, In college, I started looking for research positions in the Amazon. And I went up to this professor, and I said, hey, I really want to go and study in the rainforest. And he said, no. He said, when you're a grad student, maybe. Right now, no. And then so I went to higher ups and higher ups, and I kept asking, and no one allowed me to do it. So what I did was I found a local indigenous person in what I thought was the wildest part of the Amazon. And I got myself, a, I kind of lied a little bit and said I had more experience. I said I was a few years older. And I got myself on a plane to the Amazon. Now, the reason I grew up obsessed with the Amazon is because I grew up catching snakes when they would go into people's backyards. I would rescue the snakes before they could kill them. I would track bears. I would track foxes. I would track deer in the woods in New York State and in New Jersey. And so the Amazon, to me, was just like the greatest thing. It was like telling me I could go to space or go to, into the like, Lord of the Rings, the greatest thing, more life than anywhere else. This map is coded for vertebrate diversity. And so the cooler areas are where there's less life, and then the red areas are where there's the maximum amount, amount of life. And you see that blood red area over there in the western Amazon. That's where the Andes Mountains pour into the Amazon Basin, and that's more life than anywhere else on Earth not just in our current time, but in the entire fossil record, in the entire known universe. So going there was always my dream. And just around the time that I went there, WWF produced a report that said that we had lost 50% of the wildlife on our planet since 1970. Now, we all know that we're losing species. We all know that there's endangered species. When I heard that, though, I thought that cars were going to stop in the street, that newscasters were going to take out their earpieces, that no one was going to go to work in the morning, and that the whole world was going to change. When it didn't, I found that devastating. But what it illustrates is that we're at this crucial moment. We've never, ever had a time in history when across the planet we're threatening the systems that give us life. Our oceans come with free fish. Our forests produce rain and oxygen, and we're ruining all of that, and we're losing all of these amazing species. So I went to the Amazon fueled with that. And the region that I went to is called the Madre de Dios, the Mother of God. And it has world record numbers of birds, butterflies, reptiles, amphibians. And the second I walked into the jungle, I literally looked up at the trees and just went, I'm home. I knew that that was where I belonged. I knew that it was going to be a massive thing in my life. And I had grown up, I always had this connection to snakes. I always understood them. I always felt like I could kind of tell what they were going to do next. I always loved teaching people to not be scared of snakes, because everybody has that innate thing about snakes are scary. So when I got to the Amazon, of course, I wanted to find anacondas and every type of tree snake that there was. And I started talking to the local people about that. 
and I developed a friendship with the local guys. Now, my first time there, I was only there for a few weeks. But what they said was that they were running a research station. They were trying to do ecotourism. So instead of being loggers and gold miners and farmers, these guys are trying to bring foreigners into their jungle and educate people and share their wildlife with these people. And so they, they weren't able to do that. They didn't have access. They said, we don't have gringos. And I said, dude, I said, I have gringos. I said, I can bring you gringos. You got the wildlife? I got the gringos. Um, so I went home and I came back. And so now I'm 19 years old. And just like that, I'm working in the Amazon with indigenous people, learning from them what plants are edible, how to track jaguars, where to find wildlife, what the habits of the birds are. And one of the, the most amazing animal to me when I was growing up was always a giant anteater. I had this dream about giant anteaters that I just thought is a seven foot animal from nose to tail. It's this giant insectivorous freak with this huge tail. And in Peru, they call it oso bandera gigante, which literally means bear flag giant because they just don't know what to call it. <laughs> and they have these, these hooks. They have the biggest claws of any mammal, bigger than a grizzly bear, bigger than a tiger. Um, there's actually one hunter I know who was he was hunting and his dogs were ahead of him. And as he's running through the jungle, his dogs went around a turn and he heard a yelp. And as this guy came around the turn, he put his gun up and this giant anteater stood up on its hind legs with his claws out. And they got these forearms and they got these claws. It's like Wolverine, but an animal. And the thing had already gorged one dog and it took the other dog and it snapped its neck and then it started walking on its hind legs after this, this guy's about this big. So he was telling me how it was towering over him and attacking him. But they have this, this reputation of being these fearsome animals. Meanwhile, they have no teeth and they eat bugs. They're very, very peaceful animals. And as you can see in this photo, the babies ride on their mother's backs. And so when I was 19 and I was in the jungle, um, I never expected it, but a mother anteater that was on the river. See, they're so, they're so powerful and they can fend off jaguars and it inspires these local legends. So the local people believe that if you shoot an anteater, they won't die. So a lot of young men go out and they want to shoot an anteater just to see what happens. So someone had shot a mother anteater and the baby that was on her back was left. And so at 19 years old, I inherited Lulu. That's Lulu. And she didn't have her mom to ride on, on, on the back. And the amazing thing, you would think an anteater, a tiny little brain, you wouldn't think that they're such emotional animals. This little anteater was devastated that she was an orphan. She wanted to hug something all day long. This was the first moment I met her, and I pretty much didn't put her down for the next few months. She wanted to ride on my back. So I had to become a mother anteater. So I had to walk around the forest on my hands and knees, trying to teach her to look for ants, trying to teach her, like, I would have to go poke my nose into termite nests. And then when she would sleep, I would put her in the hammock. She didn't want the hammock. She'd come clawing after me. If I tried to make her food, she would tear my jeans apart because she was so excited. She had, like, scissor hands, like crazy knives on her hands. So the only thing I could do was when I slept, I slept with her. And now an anteater has about... 12-inch tongue, huge long tongues that they stick all the way down into termite nests. And when an anteater wants to wake you up and she's sleeping on your chest, she fires that 12-inch tongue straight into your nose, <laughs> straight into your ears. So I've had my brain cleaned by an anteater. Um, I stayed with her as long as I could. We eventually released her back into the jungle. But this animal taught me so much about the jungle because I had to spend days and days and days walking around the forest with no one else but this little wild animal. And, and that was how I first developed my real connection with the Amazon. And now during this time, the guy who was leading the research station was this indigenous man named JJ. And his family, he has this giant family of all these brothers, and he grew up in the forest. And so he was teaching me, again, the medicinal plants, how to track animals. He was teaching me everything. And the only thing that I could give him back was that I knew snakes. He was terrified of snakes. So I started teaching him. I would catch a snake and show these guys. Because they don't, they don't eat snakes. They don't interact with them. Everything else they know. They know everything about that forest. So I was giving this one thing that I could teach them was snakes. And of course, the, the question eventually arose, where are the anacondas? I was like, I want to see the big ones. Um, now, when most people think of anacondas, they think of these giant, constricting, man-eating monsters. Um, 
when I spoke to the local people, they said the same thing. Oh, so-and-so's father got eaten. This kid over here down the street, he got eaten. Everyone had these crazy stories about anacondas. So when I finally made good enough friends with the indigenous people, that they invited me on an expedition way up into the jungle. We went for a week just up. That was the start of the expedition. We had to hunt for our own food. We had to sleep on the beaches. We were in places. You go to the last town, then you go to the last settlement, and then you go to the last place with a name. That's how big the Amazon is, that there's just places where no one goes. And so we went out there, and we were looking for snakes, and of course they were all terrified. And the result was that we came back, and we caught this. This was like a 12-foot female. That's JJ, by the way. That's the guy that taught me the jungle. Um, and again, my love of snakes opened this world for me. Because I could teach JJ about snakes, I was different than the other gringos that showed up. Um, and, and, and that's how I got invited on that expedition. And so we rolled back with this photo. We rolled back after catching this huge anaconda. We'd measured her. And I had these dreams of studying anacondas. But we got back to the town. And JJ's father was there. And he's this 80-year-old man who's living in the jungle by himself. And he takes a look at the photo. And he was like, es una anacondita. He's like, it's the smallest anaconda I've ever seen. <laughs> he was like disgusted with us. He was like, you call yourselves men. <laughs> and so he. He said, he was like, guys, he's like, if you want to stop playing with worms, he was like, go to the floating forest. He's like, go where, go where everybody disappears because the big ones are there. Um, and so, and so, and you can see how this starts snowballing. I went as like a research volunteer and then I started taking care of an anteater. And then all of a sudden now we're going to document this place that no one understands, that no one can explain to me what it is. I said, what is a floating forest? And they said, you'll see when you get there. So we went on another expedition to this floating forest. And what you have here is my best representation of it. It's a difficult thing to explain. But it's basically a lake with all of this floating grass on top of it. So when we got to the edge of this thing, we all got to the edge. And you, you, you push down on the grass, and everything starts rippling across this whole lake. And there's all this black water. So we were there at night. It took us all day to get there. So you could see the stars in the sky, and you could see the stars in the lake. And you can see the eyes of crocodiles came in as they're moving around. So this was a place where everyone was terrified. All the guys stood back. Me and JJ went forward. And we wanted to find anacondas. And as we're going through this grass, there's trees coming out of these islands of floating forest. There's species of predatory plants that we've never seen anywhere else. We were just seeing this absolute wonderland. Even for the Amazon, this place is a freak show. And as we're going, JJ's seeing these pathways, these big, smooth pathways. And he's going, this is anaconda. And this is anaconda. And I was like, these are not anaconda tracks. I was like, some of them are this big. And he's going, these are anaconda. These are anaconda. And around 2 AM, we came to these two. The larger one, I'm positive, is, would have shattered the world record. She was about 25 feet. And she had a smaller one on top of her. And, I have one measurement from this snake, and that is when I looked at her, I said, this is the front cover of National Geographic if I could catch this snake. So I jumped on her back. And when she started going, I took one measurement, and that is that I couldn't get my arms around her. My fingers couldn't touch. So that's the one thing I have is that she had a six-foot girth. And so she was going through the grass, and then as she was diving down, she could have turned around and just eaten me on the spot. She didn't. She just wanted to go down into the water and escape. And that's the thing that the floating forest does. It's this place where they can bask in the sun, lay on the grass, and if anything threatens them, they just pop down into the water. So she did that, and I had to make the decision, let go of her and live, or hold on and be carried to the bottom of the floating forest. So um, Now, when I tell that story, uh, and I, I tell that story all over the world, I sometimes I say, how many people believe that story? And like everyone's just like, you didn't ride an anaconda. Um, but I'll counter that with one more large anaconda story. And that is that a few years later, JJ and I have started bringing groups from all over the world. We started Tamandua Expeditions. We had a research station. And this girl came who was obsessed with anaconda. She said it was her dream to find the biggest snake in the world. And we went out on a five-week expedition. And on this expedition, we had, we had people from England, from France. We had this dude from Finland who was like a pa demolitions expert, para jumper, like super badass guy, jujitsu expert. Um, nothing scared him the whole time he was in the Amazon. But this girl was so obsessed with anacondas, and after four weeks, we'd found zero. Even though they are so big, they're hard to find, and they're becoming harder to find. 
And that was becoming part of what we were trying to study. And so I took this group, which is a terrible idea, I took this group to the floating forest. It was a group of travelers that I took to the floating forest. And we went out and we searched the whole thing. And we were out there for hours and hours and we came back and nothing. And the sky was gray and the group was tired and we were four weeks into this expedition. And I was like, all right, let's go back. I'm so done. And this girl was like, please, can we just do one more? Please, 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 can we just go out on our own? And I was like, this is a really bad idea. And I was like, yeah, go for it. And so they all split up. The girl, this girl went that way and the Finnish dude went that way. His name is Jonas. And it, that's when it happened. He goes, I hear all the way from over there. He goes, Paul. And I'm like, what? He goes, there's something here. And you can just hear in someone's voice when there's something big happening. And I go, what is it? And he goes, I don't know. <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's either a snake or it's not. So I trudge through the floating forest. And again, when you walk on this thing, you walk, and then you go down up to your neck in black water, or you get stung in the face by wasps. I get to this guy, and this is a person that is scared of nothing. And he turns around to me, and he goes, and his face is green. Because in front of him is a 22-foot jet black anaconda dead asleep. And by now, it had been a few years. So now the dream of National Geographic was real. They had called us. They knew we were doing research on anacondas. And they said, if you can show us a big one, we'll have a film crew there. And the whole group knew it. So as we're standing there, I was like, dude, listen, this is what we're going to do. I was like, I'm going to get the head. You're going to get the body. And we're coming up with this plan. And all of a sudden, this anaconda just wakes up. You see her tongue go up and go down. Her tongue is as thick as my fingers. And her whole body just goes Poof, and flexes. And it knocks us back. And while I'm still trying to come up with a plan, I'm like, dude, listen, OK, what I'm going to do. And she starts moving, and her head goes down into the water. And we're running out of time. And this dude just goes, listen to me, listen to me. He goes, I trust you. And he just jumps on the anaconda. And then I got to watch a Finnish dude ride an anaconda. So two people have done it. The rest of the group showed up. And this snake was so big that seven people couldn't pull her out of the floating forest. So again, we didn't have proof of that story. Eventually, we did get funding and research um, permits. And this is a world record for the largest anaconda that was wild caught, verifiably measured, named after my grandmother, Eleanor. She wasn't happy about that. Um, <laughs> not at all. But 18.6 feet long and 100 kilos and it took 10 of us to pull her out of the water. And you can see in this photo, her tail keeps going for quite a while. But what really motivates us, aside from the fact that these are beautiful, amazing animals, is their value as apex predators. Because an anaconda is born only about this long. They're little snakes. They can be eaten by birds, by baby crocodiles, and then they grow, and very few animals you know, usually you have a small lizard eats bugs. You have, you know, things have certain sizes in the ecosystem. An anaconda actually jumps all those levels and becomes something that can eat the largest animals in the Amazon. And so they have this huge impact on their ecosystem. And so as we're seeing less and less anacondas, we're trying to figure out how that's affecting the Amazon. This was another shot of her as we were taking measurements. We took scale samples. We measured her length. Um, her head was the size of a Rottweiler. She was just the most incredible thing. And the thing is, they have indeterminate growth. So how old is this snake? How many years has she been living in that ecosystem, eating animals, keeping balance over all of it? How much influence do all the anacondas all over the Amazon have in creating this giant life-giving system that is the Amazon for us? Um, so we've been using the story of anacondas to try and grab people, just like you, I use the story of tigers, and everyone uses tigers and elephants and all these famous species that inspire people to grab the public's attention. And anacondas are very good at that. And the thing that we've been really using them for is fighting gold mining. So everything in this photo should be green. All of that used to be forest. Gold mining in the Amazon happens. The gold is mixed in with the sediment. So you have to actually cut down the forest, burn the forest, and then suck up the clay and use mercury to bind it out. So not only do they destroy the forest, then they pollute it with mercury. And so as that goes into the rivers, you see it going to the fish, into the birds, into the crocodiles, and of course at the top, the anacondas. And so that's, that's, that's where all of this led. It started as, dude, let's go find snakes. And now, to, now it's turned into, how do we protect this beautiful apex predator in the Amazon? And we're still working on those projects today. Now, 
the river that we work on, this is the Las Piedras River, and this was about 2008. The thing is, Rainforest 101, what happens when you cut a road into a rainforest? Humans get in. And this road, that little road right up there that comes off the river was cut in 2009. And the next year, the rainforest looked like this. It went from pristine habitat to farm fields, all the wildlife left. And this is what, I mean, everyone probably heard about the Amazon fires this year. This is what we're seeing. We're seeing people going into the Amazon and starting cacao farms, soybean farms, letting their cattle graze on it. It's, it's, not, it's not in any way worthwhile to cut down thousand-year-old trees with thousands of species living on them for a farm. And so that's what we've been trying to stop. So at this point in the Amazon, we bring people from all over the world We've also started now trying to get larger funding. We're trying to bring in the, the forces that allow us to protect it. So we had the Amazon fires this year. The last few weeks, I've been coordinating with the P Peruvian Navy to try and stop some of these farmers. We're actually buying parcels of land. We're employing the local people on the river to be rangers instead of loggers, to protect their river instead of cutting it down. And so today, Jungle Keepers works with Tamandua Expeditions, and all told, we're protecting over 30,000 acres in the Amazon, which is still just a teardrop in the ocean. But when I go to sleep at night, I think about all the animals, all like Lulu and all the anacondas and all the monkeys and all the birds that are safe in there, all those heartbeats. Um, now, we're going to ping pong back and forth here. But from the Amazon, what made a kid from Brooklyn go to India? Um, I had a professor who said he wanted to, me to go on a study abroad to India. And the only, I mean, I, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. And I had nothing in my head except for the fact that I had seen Jungle Book as a kid and was excited to see tigers and elephants. And so I came on a study abroad to India, and I spent a few, I spent a few months. Um, and of course, I was, you know, the Amazon, you don't, have, you don't have anything that will actually kill you, other than mosquitoes. I mean, anaconda won't bother you. Jaguar is not that big. Um, so when I got here, it was just this whole new set of animals and a whole new conservation reality. Because in the Amazon, you have miles and miles and miles of forest and tiny human settlements. And then in India, if you look at the map, it's just so many farms and villages and roads and human habitation. And then you have these, these farm, forests that are fragmented. And so when I do this presentation in the US, I take people through the Indian wildlife, through peacocks and through the snakes that I was so excited to find. Ah, and another story about snakes. As I'm looking, as I started living in Bangalore, I started rescuing snakes right away because I saw local people trying to kill them. And snakes once again led me to something incredible in my life because the creature I didn't expect to find was my wife. <laughs> One night at a music festival, I got called for a snake rescue and we met in the middle and that changed everything. And then I ended up spending years and years and years in India and um, feeling more at home here than anywhere else. Um, so the other thing I try to do with people when I'm doing this abroad is I, you know, I ask them, you know, do they know about peacocks? Yeah. Do they know about cobras? Yeah. Have you ever seen a bear cock? <laughs> and some people go, where do, they, where, where do those live? <laughs> what part of India is that? <laughs> I can't help you. Um, but the first time I saw a bison, I lost my mind. Because, I mean, these things are the largest bovine species. And, of course, I really, I really, literally the thing that got me here was the tigers and the elephants. That's what the professor said. I said, why would I leave the Amazon? He went, more tigers and elephants than anywhere else in the world. And that's what got me here. And I remember the first time I saw the skull of a bison and how big it was. And I looked at that and I said, if... If a tiger can take that down, how powerful is a tiger? Because these things are seven feet and just like muscles, like a bodybuilder. And that showed me, in a way, that I actually had no idea what a tiger really was. Um, and, and humor me on this, that I don't think that most of us think about tigers um, for what they truly are. When I was growing up, I never thought about the size of a tiger. And in the Amazon, you get used to jaguars, which are pretty reasonably sized. They're strong, but they're, they're quite small. I expected a tiger to be 
something manageable. This is a six-month-old cub. It's a baby. When I was doing this, this was while I was writing The Girl and the Tiger, um, people in the US, um, a tiger expert, allowed me to come and interact with this tiger. And he said, yeah, 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 the cub, the cub, the cub. And he brought out, he goes, let me bring out an adult. And for the first time in my life, I was so terrified um, that the photographer who was there, he took me aside and he's like, you got to stop looking so scared. <laughs> this is a person that's ridden anacondas. And I was just horrified <laughs> by how big this thing was. If you look at the size of my neck and the size of his neck, and you can't see those dinner plate sized paws. But he was so big and the intelligence scared me as well. Like there's just no scenario in which a human can win against a tiger if you're not armed. They're so powerful. And when you're up close to them, the fact that their tongues have teeth on them, that they can literally lick the skin off of their prey. Now the other thing, speaking of tiger prey, I just read this recently that a lot of prey species actually see in different spectrums than we do, and they, they're sort of in the way we are colorblind, where they don't actually see orange. So for a deer in the forest where we see this, it looks a little bit more camouflaged. And so they're basically invisible. They're faster than us. They have a 20-foot vertical leap. They have spikes on their tongues. These incredible animals. Um, and so my wife and I started going around South India, and going through the, through the areas where we thought there might be migrating tigers, because this was a story that I thought was just incredible. Um, of course, I knew about the history of it, all of the, the tiger hunts, the, the, you know, the, the tourism around hunting tigers, that in 1900 there was 100,000 tigers on Earth, and now there's just under 4,000. And so all of this was, you know, had turned, turned tigers into this, like, obsession in my head where I was like, I, I really wanted to understand how tigers were still surviving. Because India, you have the best case scenario. You have more tigers here than anywhere else. Go to Burma and see how tigers are doing. Go to China and see how tigers are doing. The, the rest of their range. Um, has anybody ever seen this photo of the guy who put machine guns on his Rolls Royce because he would go out and shoot tigers all the time? We've lost so much of tiger habitat that this, this, was, this was like 1900, and then this is today where there might be tigers. This is a graphic I had of the, the numbers going down. But that story of tigers that have to, you know, because if you have a forest saturated with any big cat, once there's, once there's young, they have to move to a new territory or fight for the territory that's in that forest. And so you have things like this where there's migrating tigers. You guys probably know most of this. I'm just, but this was so captivating to me. And this picture um, was a story that absolutely stuck with me. This is a tigress, tigress named Kala. And she fell into a well in, I think it was central India. And the forest department pulled her out, and they stuck a radio collar on her. And then they, they monitored her once they released her. And what she was doing was during the night, she would move through these villages. And during the day, she would go under a bush and just wait. She'd wait for the farmers. And there would be farmers like 50 feet away. And here's this giant striped cat that just knows, don't mess with the humans. And she would move on the next night. And it was like that story to me was so incredible. And we all heard about Avni last year. This was a picture of Avni and her cubs before she got shot. Um, but I was searching. I mean, I found this so captivating. And then, of course, you know, in the Amazon, I went out and I looked for anacondas. And I found a way to use anacondas to protect forest. I wrote a book that brought in big funders. And now we're, we have jungle keepers, and we're protecting it. And so as we went on these adventures in South India, it was like I started realizing less than 4,000 tigers. Like, I was like, what is, the, what is the, the likelihood of seeing one? It became like an obsession. I remember the first time I saw a tiger track, I like fell to my knees, and I was just feeling it because I couldn't believe that this like mythical thing. Um, you know. And then along the way, of course, how can you talk about Indian jungles without talking about elephants? And as I, as, I, as I bring these stories back to the US, I try to explain to people what roads do to elephant migration. <laughs> I mean, the fact that we're everywhere, the fact that they can't cross the street, the fact that there's train tracks, the fact that we build highways through their national parks. You know, these, someone, someone very wise once called elephants, they said, like, yeah, they're our older siblings. And I asked him what he meant by that. And he was saying how if you go back 10,000 years, Think about anacondas, tigers. Think of any of these animals. They, 
they made these ecosystems with the predators regulating everything and species like elephants carrying seeds and breaking down plants and they literally created the forests that we grew up in as a species. And I thought that that was a beautiful thought, especially when you see elephants and you see how emotional they are. And as we were on this tiger trail, um, seeing the stress in the faces of elephants was something that affected me a lot. And as I started spending time with elephants and realizing that they're basically, they're basically us. They look, I mean, they're so intelligent that I, I think that they should be represented in government. I mean, they should literally, they should, they should have people in parliament and Congress or whatever it is, wherever they, wherever they exist, that can advocate for them. I mean, they're so emotionally intelligent and they exert such a profound impact on their ecosystems and on our, and on our crops and our cars. Um, the, has anyone heard of Ramachandran, the huge temple elephant that's killed numerous cows and other elephants and trainers because they took him out of the wild and they stuck him in the back of a temple. Um, seeing elephant suffering was something that affected me a lot. And so as we started working in India, I would spend a half the year in India, go back to the Amazon, and all of this started taking shape. Now, the first time I saw a herd of wild elephants, I was walking and there was a stream. And so imagine the edge of the, stream, edge of the stage is the stream, and I was walking, and there was elephants on the other side. And I'd heard the stories about, you have to be so careful with these elephants, the farmers, you know, they steal crops and there's this whole thing back and forth and the elephants will kill you. I said, elephant's not gonna kill me. Um, I was walking along this stream and they were all over there. So I thought I was safe and I had this really like Kipling-like idea. I was like, I'm gonna sit in the tree and I'm gonna make notes in my notebook and I'm gonna, it's gonna be so cool. And as I'm walking through the forest, I just, I'm looking at the herd and I stop and there's the hind side of this massive bull elephant. And I'm literally three feet away from this thing. And he turns to me like this and just looks at me like, what? <laughs> this thing, he was so disgraced and so furious that I'd gotten that close to him. And he smacks a tree in half. And I went running for my life. And as I'm running through the lantana and dodging around trees, he's running straight through the trees. <laughs> and I threw down my backpack. And I get to the edge of the cliff. And I just hurled myself over it. And I fell down about 10 feet. And so the elephant gets to the edge of the cliff and does one of these where he's going. He almost fell on top of me. So I was laying there, and I was covered in blood, and he was trumpeting. He's trumpeting down at me, and he picked up a stick, and he threw it at me, and I gave him the finger back, and I was like, I'm alive! Um, and then I took a selfie, because I'd never seen my face like that. Um, but, but the power of that animal was, was something that just completely changed me, and the adrenaline high that I got from that lasted for, like, months. Um, but the, the serious side of, the, of an elephant chase like that is that, again, this was probably an elephant that has been harassed his whole life because he doesn't have deep jungle to go to. Um, you know, and then this, this, was a, this was something we saw in, in Coorg where this kid rode in on an elephant. He was smoking a beady. I was like nine years old. He was smoking a beady, and he rode, rides in on his elephant. He like flicks it. And he was telling us how he doesn't have parents. He has an elephant. I guess he's an orphan. Um, but he, he, we got to see him working with his elephant and the relationship that they had um, and spending time with the tribal people. And these are all stories that as I got to see these things, I realized that these are stories that people in the U.S., for example, have no concept of. Just like over here, the Amazon seems so exotic. For people in the U.S., when you tell people that there's a nine-year-old that rides an elephant all day long and has no parents, their, their jaws hit the floor. Um, and, and this was watching this, watching the tribal communities where this guy was on this elephant and his friends were up in the trees cutting figs and letting the branches fall. And this elephant would just lift him onto his back and this kid would tie him on. The fact that we're walking around with iPhones and cars and these guys are still living this incredible, incredibly close to nature sort of lifestyle was, was just something that I, I felt like had to be told. And then uh, this, was, this was when he was getting water. Um, but the, the mahout tribal relationship was something that really stuck with me. And, and then realizing one thing that, that working in South India taught me, because in the Amazon, the indigenous people, there's, there's so much forest that they're still, they're still very much in charge of it. Seeing how displaced tribal people, these top two pictures were pictures that I took with the community in the forest, and the bottom two pictures were tribal people that had been forcibly removed from their forest. And I've never seen devastation like that. Um, now, this snake, King Cobra, 
was, uh, had gone into a village last year, and at the time, we got called to go, to go watch the release of it. And the guy who was rescuing it, this guy Snake Joy, um, he, was the, he was the rescuer. He, I said, why did the snake, you know, why did it come out of the forest and go into the house? And he, I said, was it hunting? And he's like, no, they, you know, they, of course they eat other snakes. He goes, it's thirsty. And I, we got this video of the snake drinking water, which has, is not something that I've, I've ever, ever seen before on such a big venomous snake. You can just see this snake was so thirsty that as soon as he pours the water, you just see the snake start to drink it. And here's this giant snake that everyone's scared of. Just wants a drink of water. See, aren't they cute? Don't you guys think they're cute? Um, so all that, all that was going on. Um, and, and through all of this, I try to, I try to with everything I do, um, connect people to conservation. You know, when people come with us, with me and JJ to the Amazon, we're taking people that live in cities all over the world and giving them a chance to employ local people to protect their forest. When I wrote Mother of God, my first book, it inspired people about the Amazon and we tried to make something happen for the forest in the Amazon. And so with all of the work that we were doing in South India, all the incredible things we were seeing, these stories like Kala the tiger and all the elephant migration stuff, I, there, was nothing, there was nothing tying it together. And I really, it was really more of a passion project for such a long time. And there was no way for me to sort of go back to the US and be like, you know, 39% of elephants that live in South India, nobody cares. Um, I, it wasn't translating. Now. I'm going to jump back to the Amazon for a second, because I think it was 2012. I was in the Amazon with JJ, and a family from Bangalore came. Mom, dad, two daughters, um, Anya and Isha. And the younger daughter walked into the jungle. And now, I have to say, at this point, I've been on these expeditions with indigenous people. They eat monkeys. So I've watched monkey hunts. I've been there for untold cruelty to animals when I go traveling with poachers. I've seen all this stuff. So I, I, you develop a certain amount of like heart callus where you're like, I'm good. Um, this, this girl at like 11 years old walks into the jungle and I s swatted a mosquito and she was like, excuse me, what are you doing? And I was like, it's a mosquito. And she was like, you're supposed to be the guy that loves wildlife, you don't kill mosquitoes. <laughs> and I was like, thanks for the advice. Um, and then, and then a few days later, she's rescuing butterflies from the kitchen. And, and soon, you know, I'd never thought of rescuing butterflies from behind the screen. There's just always a pile of dead butterflies. You know, I got bigger things to worry about. Um, but halfway through the trip, I was rescuing butterflies. Um, and I started thinking about how much it changes something when one person cares about some stuff. And um, on the last day of the trip, we were leaving the jungle. We had a great trip. We caught boa constrictors and climbed trees. and. Um, we were in this town, and there was these poachers, and they had these two yellow-footed tortoises. And in the Amazon, yellow-footed tortoises can grow about this big. They get huge, and they get to be like 70, 80 years old. And these, these poachers walked in, and they had one, and what they do is they tie, they tie its head in with bamboo. And they bring it back to the house, and they split it open with an ax, and they throw it in the soup pot. Fair enough, that's their food. Um, anyway, Isha looks at me and goes, what are you going to do about this? And I'm over there like, you don't buy endangered species off of poachers. All that's going to do is encourage them to sell those endangered species to more dumb gringos. And then she started crying. She goes, but what about these tortoises? They can't die. I know the species launched a good enough argument and a passionate enough ar argument that I went up to the poachers and I said, excuse me. I said, how much to buy your tortoise? And the guy goes, I'm not selling it. He goes, and you don't even know how to cook it. And I said, I'm not going to eat it. And this, this, in the Amazon, I can't tell you how foolish you look when you tell someone that you're going to waste a perfectly good tortoise. And he was like, you dumb foreigner. He was like, yeah, give me, give me 50 soles. So we sold it. Uh, we, we bought it and then went and released this thing. Um, but that, the idea that one person could take a cold-hearted bastard like me and make me start doing all these irrational things to start protecting the wildlife, again, like the little stuff. You know, I'm over here thinking about these huge ecosystems. Um, and the fact that I started rescuing butterflies um, and relocating tortoises, um, that stayed with me. And I, you know, I kept in touch 
with, uh, with her when she left, and she told me when they found a Black Panther at Valley School and all this stuff. And then a few years later, I got an email, and again, I was in the Amazon. I get this email, I woke up at like four in the morning, and I check my email, and I'm rubbing my eyes, and it's a question, email from Isha, and it says, I have a question about a tigress, and right away I'm like, whoa. I've still never seen a tiger at this point. There's tiger cubs, the mother's gone missing, I'm going to save them, I need to know where to bring them and what to feed them. <laughs> I came this close to dropping everything and getting on a plane and flying over here um, because that story and that amount of commitment to something that needs help from butterflies to tigers, that sort of tied it all together. And then all of the stuff that I've been showing you on the India side, the tigers, the elephants, the tribal people, that all then got tied together with the story of what if this really happened? And, and a girl actually went to rescue these tiger cubs. And I thought that this would be a way to not just give facts and figures and nonfiction stuff about tigers and elephants, but to actually take people through what it's like to be a modern tiger traveling from forest to forest. What do the elephants think? If the elephants could talk to us, what would they say? What would their opinion of us be? And that goes for all of the animals. I mean, when I see the Amazon fires and you see jaguars running for their lives and families of spider monkeys jumping through the trees, it's like, what would the, what would the animals say if they could talk to us? And so I felt like actually fiction might be the best way of going through that story. And that's what became The Girl and the Tiger. And so now um, it, it started out as you know, just driving around South India and, and this passion for, for the incredible jungles here to now this thing that is uh, spreading all over the world. And uh, this, was, this was just when finishing up. Hope this isn't too loud. I tried to spend, just like I spent time in the jungle with Lulu, I tried to spend as much time like really, truly learning from these animals. And you watch, I don't know why, but he wanted my notebook or he wanted attention. I don't know what he wanted. But you see, he tries to take my notebook. I tell him no, I tell him no, and on the third time, I point my finger at him, and I'm like, you stop it now, and watch how upset he gets. And puts his trunk in his mouth. Um, but for the animals, I feel like this is a story that they would want us to be talking about, a story that they would want us to tell. Um, when I did finally see a tiger in the wild, it's a story that I don't, really tell, because it was so intense, um, because it meant so much to me. But this is roughly what it looked like. But the reason that I've been traveling around promoting this book, trying to share this story with the world, is because for the last tigers, the elephant herd, the wild creatures that made our world, whether it's the Amazon or India, we're losing so, so much of this stuff. And animals have given me everything from the snakes to the elephants. Um, and they literally create our ecosystems. And as we're talking about the Amazon burning and fragmented forests in India, I want to leave you with the fact that it's not at all too late. I've spent the last 13 years in tropical forests and some of the most intense biodiversity hotspots on the planet. And what I've seen is that you take humpback whales. Before whaling, there were about 130,000 humpback whales. It went down to 8,000 before people started protecting them and putting bans on whaling. And now they're back up to like 86,000 whales globally. They're back. Bald eagles in the 1970s when rivers were catching fire and the US was a mess, bald eagles were going extinct because of DDT. Our national bird was dying because their eggs were cracking because of chemicals. They're back now. They're like in my backyard at home. All we have to do to protect these animals is not kill them and where they live and they will bounce back. And now as I, as I go around the world telling people about the work in the Amazon and about the stuff that's going on in India, they, they're constantly asking me, you know, is it too late? What do we do during the Amazon fires? I had people messaging me saying like, this is it. This is the end of the world. I feel so helpless. And it's like, no, it's not rocket science. All we gotta do is not cut down trees and not dump chemicals into our oceans to destroy the fisheries and it will all bounce back. But that's the point of this book, that's the point of Tamandua, that's the point of me being here tonight, is that I feel like it's the message that the animals would want to send. I feel like that we are the most important generation in history, because if we keep messing it up, it's going to be too late, but we also could be the ones that pull it back. I've seen it. I've seen it so many times. 
I started out as a kid that just loved snakes and wildlife, and now I'm protecting 30,000 acres. Someone comes to the Amazon and says, I want to protect butterflies, and it turns into a book that's changing people's minds, and they're trying to start a, a tiger reserve. And they're they, people in the US want to actually create a new way station in between protected areas. And my, the point of all of this is to explain that we need all hands on deck for this. I need as much help as I can to protect the Amazon. Here, there's so much incredible conservation work that is inspiring. Um, thank you so much for being here and talking about all this stuff and listening to my crazy stories. And that's it. Hello. Thank you, Paul. That was absolutely fascinating Thank and you. made all the more uh, enjoyable because of you're such a great uh, speaker and actor. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did a lot of unexpected things like leaping on the stage and stuff. It really sort of transported us. I'm, I just told you, I'm a wild animal. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even believe now you allow people like me in places like this. <laughs> well, we're happy to have you here. but. Um, you know, I had a list of questions, and I think you've sort of answered a lot of them um, already in your. But, um, but and 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 also we'll, we'll sort of get to the Q and A. I'm sure the audience is, uh, you know, has has have a lot of questions for you. But um, no, I mean, I'm I'm actually just fascinated by the fact that you started so early and you did so many things, and you've. And you're an in intrepid adventurer. I mean, I read a little bit about what you've done. I mean, I know that you just take your canoe and take your tent and you go off for like weeks into the jungle. And uh, and I was going to ask you what drives you, but now I think we all know what drives you. I mean, it's just this incredible love for the jungle. Yeah. And all I can say is that if I had a son like you, I'd be worried all the time. I don't know how Gauri managed. Gauri, did, does, he, does he sort of, are you worried every time he takes off into the jungle? No, nah, she's not worried. <laughs> Even my mom's not worried anymore. Yeah. I said, I told her uh, earlier this year, I said, we're going to the floating forest again. And she goes, make sure you have the big knife on you. I said, yeah, yeah, all right. She, she, she doesn't say don't go. She just says, be prepared. So at what age did you start? I mean, when did you start? Uh, start when did you, when did you go off into the Amazon and start working? Uh, that was 18. Though? You were 18. And I'm 32 now. OK, wow. Um, but That's I was you know, this, this big, years. and all I wanted to do was hang out with frogs and snakes yeah. and catch you know, praying yeah. mantises yeah, and no, stuff. I can see. And so when you go off for these two and three weeks on your own in the Amazon, what do you, what do, you do? I mean, where do you go? I mean, do you, go, do you have a guide or do you just go and you would? No, you want to get fun. lost. You want, That's yeah. the purpose. There's only so many places on earth where, you, where this forest right. big enough to go get lost. And so to be um, in the presence of species that no one's ever seen, of those ancient, ancient trees and places where the animals aren't even scared of humans because yeah. they've never seen one. Right. Um, to me, that's, that's important, and it gives me the tools um, to then come back and write about it in a, in a way that I can communicate it to other people. To me, having those intense experiences, getting chased by an elephant, riding an anaconda, I mean, it sounds, I'm, I'm sure a few people in the audience have just like rolled their eyes when I said those things, but um, it's not all about that. I mean, yes, 99.99% of the time we're observing things from a distance, and you know, but the, those experiences are the things that sort of can, you know, grab people that aren't in the wildlife world. Yeah. If I start talking about how awesome little kukri snakes are, most people are going to be like, all right. But uh, tell us a little more about your anaconda research, actually. I mean, what what exactly is Tamandua doing, and what uh, uh, well, are they are they based in in Peru? Yeah. So the, with the anacondas, we are trying to monitor how they move through the ecosystem. And the other problem is that we don't know how many there are. You read, you know, you say, okay, this species is endangered, this species is doing well, this species is recovering. We don't have counts on anacondas, and they're so influential in the Amazon. So 
we're trying to, trying to figure out a way of quantifying how many anacondas there are. Because even when there's a 25-foot snake in front of you, a lot of the times you can't see it. It's either under the mud or under something. They're incredibly camouflaged. And what's the extent of their territory? Are they all over? Um, oh, all through the Orinoco yeah. and Amazon base. I mean, their territory is huge. Yeah. Um, but we still know so little about them. About them. Yeah. Really? I mean, it's, you mean there's not enough research done uh, before? Uh, your your um, uh, organization started. Uh, well, they've been researched them. in a in there's a place called the Venezuelan Llanos, and there's right. a guy named Jesus Rivas who's been studying them for years and years and years. But that's not the Amazon; that's a wetland, in the deep jungle. We don't know. We don't know how big they get. We don't know how much influence they're exerting on the ecosystem. We don't know how much the gold mining mercury is bioaccumulating in their skin and it, or possibly influencing their fetal development. So does your study include all this, uh, uh, yeah. all, all this as well, mm -hmm. really? And, have, and, and what is it, what, so far, what have you found we, out? We don't have numbers yet. We're still, we're still trying yeah. to figure out our methods. Yeah, no, it sounds yeah. really scary, actually. It's not. It's wonderful. No, yeah. I mean the, the whole mercury in the, I mean the whole oh, mercury that, yes. story, yeah. Yes, there's you know, like birth defects and that, that the in fact people. That you don't know. And, yes, that yeah. is very scary. Yeah. I agree yeah. with you on that. Yeah, I was no, like, I'm don't not, call snakes scary. No, I'm not scared of snakes. I love them, actually. I think they're really beautiful. But um, so from, I know that you talked a little bit about the differences between the two jungles, but you know, you're constantly traveling between these two ecosystems. How has it changed you, how your perspective as a, uh, as a conservationist, as a wildlife researcher, the two completely different approaches to, con you know, to, like yeah. you said, I mean, in India, it's like little islands mm -hmm. of jungle in the middle of densely populated uh, uh, areas. Yeah. So, did it change your whole perspective and your approach to conservation? Because uh, you know, there's so much of man-animal conflict here. And yeah, I mean, wor working in South India made did a few things. Because first, the the stakes are so much against the forest and the wild compared to the Amazon, where it's just so much forest. We're here. The fact that there's so many local organizations, there's the forest department. The fact that everyday citizens care so much more about their wildlife than they do in other countries that that there's more tigers here than anywhere else. Like, you know, there's, there's such amazing projects happening here, and there's a much better consciousness. Exactly. Like, I try to bring that back to the U.S. and explain, like, hey, guys, take pride in your, in your backyards. Everyone's like, oh, the Amazon's burning. I'm like, so is your backyard. Yeah. It's a waste dump. Like, you know, there, there's people in New York City that are really upset about the Amazon. It's like... No, so is the forest that you work in in Peru, is it uh, protected? No. Oh. No, that river is so it's wild. Not they're, not, they're not reserves? They're we, not, we have uh, created one. Oh, but okay. that's just because oh, so that's we've decided difference. that we need right. to. The, um, our river is so wild that in the headwaters of the Las Piedras River, there are still tribes that have never seen the outside world. They've never seen metal. They missed out on the whole discovery of the wheel thing. They still live up there naked with bows and arrows. Mm -hmm. And if any one of us was to go interact with them, the whole tribe would prob probably die just because of our like the common cold could wipe them out. They're completely isolated, which makes them very mysterious in terms of how do they survive in the jungle without getting infections? What, medi what medicines do they know about that we don't know? There's all kinds of knowledge contained there. That, yeah, you know, we have a few tribes like that here too, since I think, but we undervalue them. On the mainland? Uh, Not uncontacted. But you know, the, the, I mean, the tribal knowledge still exists in the sense a lot of them oh, have sure, taught sure, sure. medicines yeah, yeah. about you know, how to live with the jungle, how to live. Yeah. But uh, but but yeah. it's an it's a it's a crisis here. I mean I mean that's in fact what I wanted to get to at some point when we talked about your book. But um, but it was you know the story of Kala that the tiger that um, mm -hmm. that that comes into your book. Um, so it it uh, what's interesting I mean we have I mean as you as you mentioned also that we have uh, in India has the most successful tiger conservation project and the numbers of tigers in India are actually growing. Mm -hmm. But the jungle areas are not. Yeah. So the conflict conflict stays, and the f and uh, the territory. If you compare, say, a Siberian tiger who has two thousand square kilometers, and we yeah. and our tigers have sixty to one hundred kilometers per per animal. I mean that conflict. But obviously, when you look at the story of Kala, she she actually adapted. Yeah. She was uh, so a tigers adapt, wildlife adapts. So. I mean, is that some kind of hope? I mean, something that we can say that we can, you know, that, that gives us, the, is that a, 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 a silver lining in this cloud that we, you know, because otherwise you're always hearing about how wildlife is, uh, you know, endangered and it's, it's yeah. you know, there are tigers being 
the, the, the man-animal conflict, especially with tigers, is, is quite uh, intense. Yeah, Most but the, of us the animals them, themselves adapt so well, and then also the fact that people care about them so much. I mean, in India, I mean, Surya, Surya where are you? There he is, R driving around Mysore with that guy, watching him rescue snakes all day long. Are you still 18 or are you 19 now? <laughs> You're 20. Okay. <laughs> but watching, watching him race around Mysore to rescue snakes from people's homes. Like, that doesn't exist where I come from. This doesn't exist in the US, and in the Amazon, they'll just kill it. There's no one who says, I'm gonna rescue these animals. I invited him to the Amazon, and he goes, what happens to the snakes? He goes, how many snakes are gonna die when I'm gone? And I was just like, that. That, to me, is the He's type of passion, thing when yeah. you see people, yeah. like, yeah. yeah. Keep doing it, man. Um. Yeah, so let's talk about your book, actually. I mean, I was reading reviews of The Girl and the Tiger, and people compare it to uh, The Jungle Book. They say it's a modern-day jungle book. But to me, I've read it, and it's actually, I mean, you say call it the uh, Anthrop Anthropocene version of The Jungle Book, where, because in a way, everything's reversed. Sher Khan is not uh, this ferocious villain that he was, and I don't know why tigers were, I mean, why the tiger yeah. was a villain in that book. But... Um, um, Colonel Hathi is not this majestic king. He's yes. a blind elephant. Uh, Kala, the, the mm -hmm. uh, little tiger cub, needs to be rescued and protected. And uh, you have, and, and you've brought all, all the various issues that we deal with in India into that story. You've got the tribals, you've got the forest department, you've got this little, and, and of course, and instead of Mowgli, we have this little girl, Isha, and I'm not sure whether Isha will be happy but she, uh, to, that I say this, but she's sitting here in the audience, actually, there in row three. Sorry, stand Isha. Stand up, stand <laughs> up. You th she's the girl who... Give her a round of applause. Inspired. <laughs> yeah, she was the one who... Do you, do you care about mosquitoes in Bangalore as much? I mean, I'm killing them all the time. <laughs> but, um, so... You, but, but you know, a, a very real and a very big problem here, of course, is, is the, our Adivasis, because yeah. they have always been traditionally living on the land. They consider themselves, uh, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. caretakers of the forest. And yet, we, uh, um, uh, we are evicting them from the forest in large numbers every year because of projects and because of conservation projects as well. I think conservationists and Mm -hmm. Tribals ought to be on the same side, but sometimes you see that they're not. Yes. You know, so is, is that a problem, and how do you deal with a problem like that? Uh, first of all, that, that's something that's so important. And you important. seem to be very close to that, because that's in your book. Well, the tribal people were the ones that gave me access to the Indian forest, the ones that know yeah. they're, they're the ones that, that know it. Um, so I felt like the, having them represented, especially as someone from, from abroad, like in the U.S., no one knows about that problem of, of tribal displacement in, in, in India. Um, so I really wanted to have the character of Thimma um, and all of the troubles that they face. But in general, like you said, about shouldn't they be on the same t side? Imagine how powerful the conservation of forests would be if yes. the wildlife people yes. and the human rights exactly. people got together. Exactly. Imagine how effective, I always say this with conservation because even in the Amazon we see it, you have these poor PhD students and you have these bunny hugging nature people that are, we're just so happy to be in nature and it's so wonderful. And then you have like oil conglomerates and while you watch, while I watch like these, these, these conservation groups fight for who gets more attention and who gets what credit, and they're literally trying to destroy each other. Yeah. While the oil guys are like, hey man, do you, do you want to destroy that and make millions of dollars? Dude, us too, cool, let's go get drinks. And they all hang out together. So while, while all the conservationists are fighting and losing, mm. those guys are laughing all the way to the bank and destroying the planet, so that has to stop. And that's one thing that, that could help the tribal situation, that could help wildlife conservation. That's one of the things that I'm trying to write about in my next book, is all of the horrible fighting I've seen in the conservation community. Yeah, but you know, you take away all those layers, and the fact is actually we are linked, we as ordinary people are linked to all those problems because of our demands, I mean, for our, you know, consumption, our demands of, of I mean, our, our modern lifestyles. So somewhere, you know, the reason why it's nice for us to actually be speaking to scientists and to conservationists like you and not to have another conservationist sitting in this chair asking you uh, like serious questions, intelligent questions, is because, you know, every day people like us open the newspaper and we're, uh, you know, reading about 
forest depleting and forest burning and climate change and wildlife mm -hmm. and and all of us actually feel really helpless so i think on behalf of everybody here i'd really like to say how do we connect ourselves to that problem and that solution you know because as as ordinary people who only sometimes consume wildlife as tourists mm -hmm. you know we do wildlife holidays and we and we probably read and some of us you know uh, um, feel we really care, but we feel helpless in terms of what does one do? So what does one do? What do people like us do? Um, I, I don't have the full answer for that, but what I've seen, and I only know the things that I've seen and experienced is um, that yes, I mean, of course, wildlife tourism does help employ tons and tons of people to protect forest. But in Indonesia, we have companies destroying the rainforest that orangutans and rhinos and tigers live in and elephants for palm oil. Right. And we're eating those in our Oreos and our Nutella yeah. and all those yeah, stupid products. It, if yeah. we stopped yeah. buying those products, you know how quickly they'd change? And so that, like, just, just dialogue, just talking to your friends and family and saying, you know. And then the other thing now I get is everyone goes, they go, I, I want to do what you do. I want to go to the jungle. And it's like, well, that might not be the most effective exactly. way to do it. Why don't you become a lawyer and take those companies yeah, to court? Exactly. You know, there's so many ways that you can in affect you can conservation. But as, as, as even as ordinary citizens, I tell everyone in the US, stop putting leaders in office that don't understand biology and that seem to hate nature. Exactly. Stop it. Exactly, yeah. I mean, how many times, I tell them, how many times are you going to take a river and go, well, this dam is going to create 500 jobs. Great. And downriver, it's going to ruin the yes. lives of 20 million people. It's yeah. ridiculous. At what point are we going get, to get savvy to that one? You know, so like stuff like that. Stop electing stupid people. Um. Right, there you are. That's where it starts. Um. Let's wait for these old guys to die and take over the world and make it better, please. <laughs> yeah. So we can't go away from here actually without going. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure you want, you want to bring that old story up, but I, I, how many of you in here know that? What story are you about to bring up? This guy was almost. I mean, he participated in our Discovery Channel episode called Eaten Alive. And um, yeah, not many hands went up. So in 2014, oh. How many people no, saw that? Many, OK. So it was, no, it was, um, I didn't find it, actually. I was trying to find it on the net. I didn't see it. But for those of you who don't know, in 2014, there was a Discovery Channel uh, did a program with him where he volunteered him volunteered to be eaten by an anaconda eaten by an anaconda right so it yeah. was but it was um, and no but but this but the story that I'm interested to tell here is that it's the controversy that it raked up in the sense before the episode was aired there were animal activists and um, animal rights organizations that came out against it and it said it shouldn't go on air and there was some um, 78,000 people on change.org, the signatures that said it shouldn't go on air, people were making a big noise about it. And Paul wrote a really nice article in The Guardian that explained why he did it. And uh, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about why you did it, because uh, it, it, seemed, it seemed like a, like a stunt, and it seemed like, uh, you know, and, uh, but, um, but there was a re and after we've seen, We've heard Paul for the last one hour. I mean, you know his passion, and you know that he would, I mean, although he might leap on the back of an anaconda, he doesn't do one. it to harm one. Yeah, right, exactly. So why do you do it? I mean, I, I thought that article was really nicely explained, and it, it, it had a very good point that you made. So if you want to tell us. Uh, desperate times, des des desperate measures. I had a TV company come, and they said, we'll give you three, we'll, we'll put a $3 million budget on a show where you get eaten by this snake, and I had already proposed, I said, come to me, with me to the Amazon, I'll show you anacondas. And they said, that's not good enough. It's not sexy enough. We need you to get eaten by an anaconda. And everyone told me not to do it. But when you watch the fires burn and you see the animals running, I travel around and I do these talks and I write these books because I feel like I am their representative. You know, if Lulu could tell me something, you know, if, if Lulu, if she's still alive, if she could, if she could, if she would have a message, it would be like, please don't burn down my house. And it's a fair play. Um, so if somebody said you can be on every home in the US and probably all over the planet for getting eaten by an anaconda and we'll, we'll give you the exposure and the platform to talk about conservation all you want, I'll say yes to that. 
I'll do, I'll do crazier stuff than that. I, that wasn't even that crazy, because I knew an anaconda wasn't probably going to eat me, probably. Um, <laughs> but then the fallout from that, and this is important, um, is as I talk about writing books and starting ecotourism companies and going on solo expeditions and tracking tigers, I'm trying all these different things because I want to find a way to make myself effective at protecting forests. You ha and I'm at the point now where people are constantly saying, how do I do what you do? How do I get the position I want? Um, but you're gonna, you better learn to love failing. Because when I did that, I thought I was, you know, oh man, I'm on TV, this is gonna be great. The US eviscerated me. I got hit by the animal rights people beforehand, Af afterhand, then everyone in the US was like, dude, he didn't even get eaten by an anaconda. <laughs> Everybody was pissed at me, and then that was it. So it really, it didn't have any conservation message. Oh, 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 and, and, when we caught that big, big snake that I named after my dear grandmother, um, I had a producer in front of me, and I caught this snake, and I had tears in my eyes, and this beautiful, beautiful anaconda, and I'm holding it, and he goes, what are you feeling right now? And I was like, just, how big is this animal? It's like, this is like a mythical creature, and how, how many years has she been in this forest, you know, guarding over things? I was like, this is literally my dream. I was like, this is such a beautiful animal, and I kissed her on the head. And then this producer goes, and what would happen if she was to bite you right now? And I was like, oh, man. I was like, she's got six rows of teeth and like 200 of them, and they're recurved. I was like, I would definitely die in a bloody, horrible way, and she'd crush all my bones. Guess which part they put in the film? Not the kiss on the head. And so they did that unfair editing where they took out all the conservation stuff, any mention of mercury, gold mining, anything that had anything to do with substance or value, they pushed out of that film thing. And then when I wrote that article, then they basically came and they were like, hey, kid, say one more word, and you'll You'll, we'll sue you so hard, your grandkids will be poor. So like, I tried something and failed miserably at it. And I'd do it again, because I thought there was the chance of helping the forest, so. Yeah, in, fa in fact, well, I think what, yeah, exactly. No, in fact, what, there was one sentence in that which struck me. You said in the rampant destruction. So everybody was actually really worried about the anaconda. I mean, the whole world and all the... Um, 78,000 signatures and everybody. Yeah. So, and what Paul says to that is in the rampant destruction of rainforest habitat, millions of animals are actually dying and even going extinct. This to me is where the real battle lies. And I slowly realize that this fact is lost on many, many people, including PETA, which is true. And I guess we fall in, yeah, some of us also fall in that many, many people. So we, have, we get caught in these little <coughs> battles which, when we don't realize the whole system is actually in peril. Yeah. Anyway, with that, let's just open this up to um, questions from the audience. Raghu standing there with a the mic. Yeah, hi. Uh, there's so many questions that I wanted to ask you. Uh, the, yeah, yeah I, I get it, one question. <laughs> All right. Pick your top 10. <laughs> OK. Um, so you have been in a situation where there is a person among animals in the Amazon, and you have been in a situation where there's an animal among humans in India. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's the difference that you have felt uh, in terms of governance, as in the government? Uh, what is the government doing in both the scenarios? And how are, what's the reaction of people different in both, in both cases? Like, uh, how are people and government helping or not helping cases in both scenarios? Uh, com com compared between the Amazon and India, how is the government helping or not helping? Okay. What were the differences you felt between both paradigms? Uh, I think it's very sim similar. I mean, wherever, wherever there's people in government, they seem to be there because they want to rule or have power or something, and they're usually tied to... Um, extractive businesses. And so in the Amazon, we have these, um, these companies that are tight with the politicians. And when they want to build a new road, they get the permission to build a new road. And then they hire all the different people, like you know the excavators and the cement companies and the thing. And again, this whole group of people makes money, and they all enjoy it. And in India, there's, I mean, there's just countless, countless examples of the same thing happen with, with the, it's not even corruption because it's, it's just, it happens everywhere. It's like if you have a project that could destroy an ecosystem, but you create a few jobs, it seems to happen. And, and, and so I think that, again, having people where we're always so worried about, you know, what, what, are, what is your stance? Is it left? Is it right? Is it something It's like the environment? I don't even hear it on the presidential debates in the U.S. They don't even bring up the environment. They're like, what do you think about climate change? 
And half of Americans are like, well, I don't believe in climate change. I haven't seen it myself. <laughs> um, and so I try, to, I, try to, I try to give people the measurables. Like, you can't debate that we're in a wildlife crisis. You can't debate that we've lost half the forests on our planet, that our oceans are collapsing. I, you know, so like you try and meet people, but I, 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 see, I see shitty government everywhere. And that's our fault. Our fault. Hi, Paul. This hey. is Ismail here. Um, so sometime last year, I had the good fortune of volunteering with Wildlife SOS, okay. um, the, the organization that is into conservation of bears and elephants. Mm -hmm. um, something that I got sensitized to during the process was also the socioeconomic factors that actually go into um, all of these things. And you know, you, you're not only solving for one issue, you're solving for multiple issues because there are communities whose livelihood depends on being a part of wildlife or wildlife being part of you. Yeah. So to be very specific, uh, the, the Kalandar community, they, they had their entire livelihood based on bears and how they were able to take bears to different parts of the country and just make them dance, basically. So has there been um, an instance where you've seen that it has been the perfect coexistence of um, you know, people and animals in the, in the sense that this could possibly be the perfect solution? You're asking if, if humans and wildlife can coexist? Can coexist and can we also solve for socioeconomic problems that arise as a result of conserving wildlife on the one hand? Mm. So for instance, you spoke about the tribal communities which were yeah. sort of removed from their habitat, right? So how do you solve for those problems as well? Well, for the tribal people, again, are, are they the ones cutting down the forest? No, it's the, you know, it's the outside society that's done that and put them in, the, in this position where it's like, well, is it, you know, is it tigers or tribals? And um, and that's horrible. Um, in the Amazon, everyone's like, these gold miners, we have to kill the gold miners, shoot the gold miners, Every, the gold miners are the villains. Um, and me and my friend from National Geographic last year, we went up this river, we were looking for, an anacondas have led us in so many wonderful places. We went up this river and everyone said, if you go up this river, you're gonna get shot. Because the gold miners will kill you. Because they're fighting with the government. Well, while they're shooting with the government, the government's trying to shoot them out. And, we went in there, you know, hey, you want a cigarette? Yeah, yeah, shake hands. Once they saw that, like, we knew the local wildlife and stuff, and I said, how much do they, how much does being a gold miner pay every day? And the guy was like, 50 soles a day. I was like, how would you like to make 150 soles a day and show foreigners the jungle? And he was like, okay. <laughs> That's how hard it was. And so, like, in so many places we've seen, that, yeah, of course humans and wildlife can co coexist. The only problem is us. The only problem is, is telling people no sometimes. You know, everybody that inherits land wants to chop it up and put a development on there and become a millionaire. It's like, well, you know, great, good for you. You just ruined a you know, forest. Like, so sometimes you have to tell people no. Can we have dancing bears? Is that in any way humane? No, just no. You gotta be told no sometimes. Um, but can we work to re-employ those people doing something else and use the knowledge that they have? Absolutely. Dude, we can do so many incredible things. We go to outer space. I can Skype FaceTime with my mom right now in the US. Like, we can really, this is, these are not actually that complex. It just needs all the brain power and it needs enough of us actually caring and living that lifestyle. Hi, Paul. Hello. Uh, we all understood uh, what you live for for all the wild animals, Amazon and uh, the South Indian jungle. How do you manage your living, but I mean, I'm certain that writing books uh, will certainly not make you a fortune, <laughs> right? Because uh, whatever royalty you might get uh, will certainly not aid you for all the conservation uh, uh, activities that you do. That's a very astute question. <laughs> um, my grandmother kept saying, when are you gonna get a real job? She goes, just go, go to the post office. She goes, it's a good job with a good pension. Um, yeah, writing books is a stupid way to make a living. Unless you're ultra famous, it's not going to make you any money. Um, doing interviews, which for the, since the Amazon fires in August, I've probably done over 100 interviews in radio stations and TV stations all over the US. They don't pay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, just, I'm, I'm professionally poor. And I live out of a backpack. Um, and. Uh, that's how I do it. I'm happy sleeping on tree roots. Um, 
hello. Hey. Hi, I have a question about uh, anacondas specifically, and then like the larger conservation in the Amazon. Mm. Are there, uh, say, transboundary conservation initiatives because the Amazon does, uh, you know, encompass yeah. these many countries, and specifically when it comes to anacondas because they're not just in Amazonia but in Orinoquia mm -hmm. as well. Uh, is there some kind of collaboration happening with researchers all across that region? Well, the, the boundaries thing is a really important thing because in some places, yes, in some places, no. Because 60% of the Amazon is in Brazil. And yeah. so when we had the Amazon fires, the first thing that popped up this year that horrified me was that the Brazilian president, Bolsonaro, was like, to the whole rest of the world, he was like, stop telling me what to do with my jungle. And then, and then the French president was saying, oh, you guys really, you have to stop the fires. And he goes, you can't even stop a church from burning down. Don't tell me about my jungle. And I was like, now they're playing tough guy politics yeah. with our life-giving systems. Um, and again, everyone in the US is going, what do we do? It's like, well, put trade incentives on, on Brazil. We'll, give you, we'll hook you up if you get your deforestation to zero. There's your problem solved. Everybody knows that money talks. Um, but. But, but no, not really on a governance level, but in terms of NGOs, in terms of researchers, people you know, actually conducting work yeah. on the field. Are the researchers collaborating? Not much. Like I said, most, most of the researchers that I'm seeing, um, resources are tight. They fight a lot. Um, for instance, like the, the guy who's studying anacondas up in Venezuela, when I contacted him, he was like, he wanted nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. um, probably because I tried to get eaten by an anaconda, but also because nobody wants to share data. But... In the Amazon, you have like eight or nine countries that are encompassing the Amazon. So it's, that is a crucial, crucial thing. And you, whether you're in the US or India, from state to state, um, the fact that you, you know, the animals don't know boundaries. We just, I mean, just last year, there was a tiger that crossed from, from Russia into China. And it's just like, oh no, it's like, it's so different, you know. But, um, sorry, is, do you think that that's something that could happen in the future, the collaboration or? Literally everything could happen if we make it. I mean, we, that, it has happened. There's great examples of it, but um, we, we, we need more support for it. You need, you need to have the organizations feeling comfortable enough to share that data. I think that they would be happy to do that once they realize that everybody wins. Right. Okay. Thank you. Raghu? Uh, hey, so I wanted to get back to the logging and uh, mining part of the Amazon area you were speaking of. Yeah. Um, if we come down to India, we have uh, illegal sand mining that happens here. Mm -hmm. And that also causes a lot of issue. And then we have uh, timbi, uh, t I mean, timber logging, uh, tim uh, illegal timber mining and all of that. So uh, one of the main causes of all of this, uh, as much as I have learned, is uh, the demand and supply, the consumption. Mm -hmm. um, now, you said you're happily poor, right? Uh, yeah. So that is something which is very, very difficult to get through uh, for a generation that has come through indus industrial revolution and all of that. I think uh, we uh, subconsciously make choices uh, that would get us a, a step closer to luxury. Mm -hmm. And it's like our uh, generation has taken survival for granted. Um, and it's a weird um, notion to put through to people to understand that this is not only our homes, right? Yeah. And it has a lot of other beings, not just uh, tigers uh, to save. Because again, if you think about tigers being conserved in India, the conservation wouldn't start unless every other political party or every other actor is trying to become ambassador to it and I don't think any of them should be teaching us how to conserve that way and it has never been this way. Um, my question being yeah. how do we um, get the generation of today to completely be aware of how important it is to conserve the right way and not the capitalistic way and not the you get what I'm saying and yeah. it's not all about yeah <laughs> I mean, I think just leading by example. I mean, look at, I mean, I, I want, I, I, th I, think, I think I'm answering your question properly. Excuse me if I'm not, but um, to get people to protect things the right way, I mean, to do anything, you have to lead by example. You have to be that, um, embody it. I mean, again, I saw 
so many conservation heroes when I was a kid that I wanted to be like. Um, and I, th I think that they showed me the way. I mean, instead of, for instance, like I, I know people in the scientific community that will capture monkeys, dart them, and, and radio tag them on their necks. And it's like, to me, that's too invasive. The people that I grew up respecting would say that that was a violation. It's not worth your research to, to, to violate a monkey like that. And so like that's, that's what I've embodied. That's what I've picked up. So I mean, if you can, can walk that walk that you believe in, then you so know. You, you don't radio tag anacondas? You don't, uh, I mean, how do you track them if you have to for your research? Um, well, no, they, they, they usually do. Um, we, there is one radio tagged anaconda, not by me. Um, but I don't believe in putting radio tags on an animal. I just think that, you know, I've seen deer that have got their foot stuck in their radio collar. Mm -hmm. we, we all know that, um, you know, plenty of tigers and jaguars and other cats all over the world that they've darted. And, and we know what they do. Use tracks, use camera traps, use infrared. You can use so many other things. But to take a wild animal, I think then the researchers should have to wear the same radio collar <laughs> if that's what they're doing. I mean. Paul, I wanted to first Soft thank you for uh, one of the most inspiring talks I've heard in my life. And wow, thank you. I'll be about 72 in two days from now. And it, through my life, I don't think I've heard uh, anything as inspiring as I've heard today. Thank, thank you. you. Wow. Uh, I, I wanted to also say that uh, the, this, the, the facts that you've put up here about the WWF prediction, uh, not prediction, estimate of uh, vertebrate loss mm -hmm. in about 40 years. 52% yeah. of the wild vertebrates have disappeared. Yes. Uh, an engineer called uh, Silesh Rao, who was one of the team which uh, invented the internet, had extended that to applying more uh, recent studies to predict that, that by 2026, Mm. All wild vertebrates will be extinct. By 2026? So that's what this man says. Yeah. So your ending of this very interesting presentation on a positive note yeah. uh, that uh, what you saw with the, with the humpback whales and, and, and the bald eagle gives us hope that it is possible to avert that calamity yeah. um, is something which I'd like uh, you to reflect on in a very, very specific uh, a sort of solution that Professor Rao had found in that, uh, that statement. He said that one of the reasons why the Amazon is all on fire mm. is because they want to open the lands out for planting more grazing area yeah. for, for cattle, you know, not, not only for cattle, for the food, for the, for the beef, uh, you know, stock yeah. which, uh, which, which comes out of, the, of Brazil. And his solution was, if enough people in the world turn vegan, yeah. and that market just disappears, mm -hmm. and then these forests would be saved. Uh, I want you to tell us whether, because it, it seems very attractive, you know, that the whole economy which supports this sort of exploitation, if, if, it, is, if it is weakened and, and brought to its knees, yeah. these animals could su survive. Uh, from your, your perspective of seeing things on the ground, how, how realistic do you think that this is? Um, well, first of all, I think the idea that there'd be no vertebrates on Earth by 2026 or whatever is just crazy. Um, I, then there'd definitely be no people. Um, he said wild vertebrates. Yeah, still. You're telling me there's going to be no more crows? Come on. I just, I don't, I don't buy that. I think there's a lot of people that are absolutely embracing this sort of doomsday porn thing that this is going on, like where they're just like, the world is dying and I just don't know what to do. I'm just gonna eat and drink and smoke my life away. It's like, well, it's really, really liberating, isn't it? Like, it's like, they're just like fight clubbing their way into like happiness. Um, I, I think that that's a, uh, that's a coward way to, to take it because f Continuing to fight is hard. Giving up is real easy. It's like, oh, we'll just have a party while the word world burns. Um, and I think a lot of these scientists, it's in their best interest. They say, oh, the, the planet's dying, so you've got to pay us so we can go to Mars. <laughs> so are you serious? Like, come on. Um, I don't know. So I, I think a lot of people get too crazy with this doomsday stuff. And uh, again, sometimes you've got to tell people no. I don't imagine that they're going to completely ban meat everywhere on Earth. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Um, but again,
again, if we just came together and said, we're not going, we've lost 50% of the, of the wild forest on this planet, we are not going to lose any more, especially not to agriculture, well, then done. I mean, I just, I just don't see the entire, you know, I, I really like to try and work with um, realistic solutions. And I think that you can't, you can't protect the whole thing from the start, but you have to start somewhere to protect the whole thing. And that's why, like, in the Amazon, you know, taking this guy and giving him another job. And then when you do that enough in the community, then they start voting for people that are pro-conservation. And it's like you can make that change little by little by little by little. Um, and that's what I see so much of in India that I find inspiring that I bring back to my work in the U.S. and the Amazon. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I definitely, definitely, definitely think there's hope. I definitely think we're the last generation where that's going to be there. I think that 100 years from now, if we keep going on the same trajectory, then we could have the, world, the end of the world party. Um, but I don't want to do that. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. Hello, sir. Uh, thank you for such a theatrical, yet such an impactful story of yours. I have a couple of questions and something to add for what uh, one of them said. So uh, I was really fascinated by the floating forest that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine you walking on a floating forest. But if you could tell us a little more about that. And another thing would be, it, I believe it's not just good enough to be a daredevil to venture into a forest that is not just beautiful but very mysterious. Uh, you might have required some, some amount of skills to tackle a lot of issues that might have arised in, within the forest. Because I believe there are also, as much as beautiful creatures, they're also venomous. And yeah. the last thing I want to say is, belief is a very powerful tool in a country like India. Mm -hmm. And... Conservation could come through beliefs. For example, if I were to save a tree outside my house, all I've got to do is put a photo of a god in front of it, and nobody would dare cut it, because yeah. fear is instilled in most people their way. So that so could we'll be see. one of the ways to get to saving. Why don't you just do that on every tree? That you <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I remember somebody, some conservationist saying that, why save tigers, how save tigers? And one of the things he put across was, if you believe or make people believe tiger is a form of God, yeah. and people will then be instilled with fear to even hurt it. Instead, they would want to protect yeah. and help them you know, come back flourishing. So, sure. Thank you. Well, I'll answer the, the, the first question about the floating forest. I spent years and years writing my first book, and I tried to get every word right and bring people through that adventure. Check it out. It's called Mother of God. Because <laughs> I can tell everyone's squirming and they want to get out of here. But in terms of changing people's mentality, I actually think that is a really good point because everyone always is um, going on about the schism between science and religion. And to me, um, nature just proves that the two of them are coexistent. I mean, I, instead of making people fear a tiger as a god, just explain to them what a tiger really is as the result of an ecosystem that keeps them alive. Um, and that can sort of become their new religion of understanding why we're here and that these Connection, animals are a part yeah. of that. So that's the best answer I have. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, yes. Thank you, Paul. That was inspirational. It was enjoyable. It was great fun. And we really wish you, you know, more success and more... Uh, Thank you so much. Save the world. <laughs> <laughs> Not alone. I'm going to go look for...